European Council of Cyprus and the Chartered Institute for Security and Investments in the UK. It is a real pleasure for me to welcome you all this evening to this third CPD webinar in the series of using good governance against bad practices, the role of professionals in the UK, Cyprus and beyond. Um, Dr. Aristodemos Yanakas, and I will be the chairman of today's webinar. All three institutions involved in this collaboration, one academic, one regulatory, and one professional, all with international remit, have in common the facilitation, promotion, and the dissemination of high-end knowledge and know-how to their respective members, including students and learners, researchers, legal, accounting, financial, and other professionals, and the wider public, so that each of them may enhance their strategic position with regards to law, compliance, ethics and integrity, rule of law, and justice within their own areas of expertise. Yukon and Cyprus is proud to enjoy MOUs with both the institutes previously mentioned. I would like to warmly thank and welcome our distinguished speakers for today, all very fine legal practitioners or scholars, for their willingness and enthusiasm to speak to us tonight, despite their busy schedules. I would also like to thank all the participants, as well as the colleagues who have worked on today's event across all institutions. It's a real pleasure and honor to be able to engage with so diverse participants to the webinar, including students, academics, and professionals, as well as the weather public. Before I continue, please be reminded that this webinar is recorded for the purpose of widening access to educational resources and that you have been asked to consent to this. I would please ask you to keep your cameras and microphones off and to use the chat functionality in the Microsoft Teams classroom to ask questions or make comments. If you do not wish to appear uh, at all on the recordings, please do not use the chat functionality. Can I also remind all that each speaker and other participants will take part in today's webinar for its purposes in an educational setting. Accordingly, what each participant will provide verbally, electronically, or otherwise, must not be accepted or interpreted as either legal or any other form of advice. You may view materials at your disposal in the MS Teams classroom, which are, you are free to take away from this webinar and use this uh, with the necessary acknowledgement. Subject to the professional background of each uh, attendee, participation may contribute to their formal or informal continued professional development, CPD, personal development, or other self-managed learning and development needs. Cyprus registered lawyers have been asked to provide their registration numbers so that UCLAN Cyprus may report their CPD hours for this webinar onto the CBA platform. It is, however, necessary to attend most of the webinar to collect the hours. Let me now turn to tonight's topic of transnational, transnational economic crime, what can be done to confront it, which forms part of the fundamentals of the CPD portfolio of all three institutions in association with legal and other practitioners and scholars. Judging by the diversity of practitioners tonight, the topic is of ever-growing importance to all professionals across jurisdictions as frontline defenders of good governance vis-a-vis uh, -vis bad practices. For the past few years, the School of Law has been organizing knowledge transfer and knowledge exchange events for professionals around the rule of law compliance, but also AML, dispute resolution and ethics on a regular basis in the form of seminars, conferences, public lectures, trainings and online activities. Turning on tonight's event, I'm very privileged to welcome, in order of appearance, Professor Mike called Levi, Professor of Criminology at Cardiff University and member of the Money Laundering Task Force of the Law Society of England and Wales, Dr. Dimitra Loizu, lecturer in International Criminal Law and Humanitarian Law, School of Law, Euclid, Cyprus, Mr. Christian Belagias, Associate Lecturer in AML Law, School of Law, Euclid, Cyprus, and Practicing Lawyer, and last but not least, Dr. Clerkos Kiriakidis, Senior Visiting Fellow, School of Law, the Euclid Cyprus. Uh, their rich bios appear in the flyer, which I'm sure you all have, and I would like to refer 
you to that rather than enumerate their long list of achievements, not only in Cyprus but international. A, warm, uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. In the international context of the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis and the aftermath of the global pandemic and various scandals in Cyprus, the UK and globally, the primary aim of the webinar is to define what is meant by economic crime, money laundering and other related forms of criminality. To these ends, the webinar seeks to achieve the three main objectives. Number one, break down some of the main types of economic crime, explain how each type may lead to commission of other crimes like money laundering, breaches of, of other areas of law, breaches of trust and breaches of regulatory code of conduct. Number two, assess the implications on the one hand of EU and Cypriot anti-money laundering law, and on the other hand, English anti-money laundering law, especially in light of the Economic Crime Transparency Enforcement Act of 2022. Number three, evaluate the steps needed to foster an institutional anti-crime culture, which is deep in respect for the rule of law, professional ethics, and good governance. The webinar format provides opportunities for participants to engage in discussions with our distinguished panelists about current issues and practical approaches for addressing the issues arising from these matters through the chat and during the question and answer session after the presentations. I would therefore like to thank you all very much for providing us with fresh analysis of progress made to, the, to date and insight of hot topics. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I would like to invite our first speaker for today, Professor Michael Levi, to deliver his presentation. Professor Levi, I sincerely hope that I'm pronouncing your surname correctly. And if not, please accept my apologies. The, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, no need for uh, apologies. Uh, uh, everybody pronounces it differently. Um, <laughs> so we, we accept the variation. I pronounce it Levy, but you don't have to do the same thing. Um, so, Kalispera, everyone. Uh, it, it's in a couple of hours. It will be Aletheria, I think. Um, but the um, but it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, I have been working in this field uh, for a long time. I did my PhD on the organization and control of bankruptcy fraud 50 years, that's five zero years ago. And uh, I did my first money laundering project in the aftermath of the Brinks Matt Gold Bullion robbery um, in 1988. Um, so I have been observing uh, the evolution of this. And it's very important for you in Cyprus and for uh, those of us in the UK, also to realize that this does not just come out of the skies. Um, it's a process of of evolution. Um, now, I think I'm in control of my own slides. Am I? So I will yes, share the yes, screen. Yes, you may, Professor. Um, I will share the screen if I can work out. Um, Top right corner. Next to um, me. Whoops. No. Um, hmm. Do you prefer me to find the slides and share them for you? I'm just looking at. Um, hmm. Uh, I, I can't access because I'm in yours, so you will have to use because I'm in your university's uh, system, so I can't. Environment. Actually okay. use, I'll do that for you right own. now. Okay. okay. You're very um, welcome. The, um, but meanwhile, I'll continue uh, talking. Um, and the, the point is that um, this does not come uh, ex cathedra from the from the skies. Um, it comes from uh, legislation and uh, legislation comes from politics. 
So we have to see it in that kind of context. Next slide, please. Um, can we have next slides? Yeah, so let's. Um, OK, well, uh, so I'll start with some definitions because that is what I've been told to do. Um, the whole concept of economic crime is a protean mess. Um, and people often mean different kinds of things. The IMF defined financial crimes as a subset of financial abuse and any nonviolent crime which results in a financial loss. Uh, so that's a very broad range. The UN Crime Congress refers similar to any nonviolent crime that results in a financial loss. Uh, now, the issue of tax evasion, which is including the uh, was a controversial area and uh, for a long time that was not accepted to be part of the money laundering. Um, uh, tax evasion was not a predicate crime for money laundering, for example, but now we have gradually moved uh, to an all crimes uh, system for money laundering, but nevertheless economic crime generally refers to fraud, to product counterfeiting, uh, to tax evasion uh, and to, to money laundering. Uh, the next slide, please. So we have to try and think straight about economic and organized crime. Uh, I'm a social scientist as well as a, as a lawyer. So um, I try to think about it in a, uh, in a real world way. Uh, now, organized crime, fraud and corruption used to be regarded as separate things. Uh, when I was in charge of the organized crime, uh, situation reports for the Council of Europe, uh, Cyprus and uh, uh, Malta used to regularly reply, we don't have any organized crime in Cyprus um, or in Malta. Uh, Turkey used to say we, uh, the organized crime in Turkey is the result of the PKK. So you can see that everybody brings their own way of thinking uh, to this, um, but money laundering applies to all crimes. So it's a question of how much overlap there is between fraud, organized crime and corruption. Um, and I could have had the corruption slide overlapping with fraud more than I did. Uh, it, it varies over time. But the point is that for a country like Cyprus, which has relatively little uh, indigenous or internal organized crime, you're mostly acting um, with the money generated by organized crime elsewhere. And the same argument uh, has been made of the UK, uh, though we have more uh, internal organized crime. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one useful way of thinking about uh, economic crime is to split it up into crimes with identifiable victims and crimes with generic victims. Uh, identifiable victims, I've just uh, done a report um, which is online, downloadable free now, uh, on fraud against uh, individuals in, in the West Midlands. Um, and the point is that about 4.5 million people in England and Wales alone are victims of fraud in any given year. Um, so that's a, a lot. That's a very widespread issue. And all of that, of course, generates um, money which has to be used or saved somehow. Uh, online, offline and hybrid. Uh, fraud against businesses, large and small. Uh, can be in a variety of ways, and corruption of the private sector, for example, by procurement frauds. Uh, some of them 
uh, by internal collusion. So accountants and lawyers may have to deal with all of those kinds of things. And then there are crimes with generic victims. They're frauds against the government. You know, for example, tax, social security, procurement, both getting contracts by bribes and providing substandard quality uh, products. That's why uh, the roads in some countries deteriorate faster than others. Um, and there are, of course, also COVID-19 related procurement frauds and uh, also government grants frauds. And then there's money laundering, um, which I put as a crime with generic victims because in a way it's the predicate crime that causes most of the harm. The money laundering is an accessory to those uh, predicate crimes. And uh, I've broken them up into proceeds of domestic and foreign frauds and bribes, other crimes with victims, and illegal market offences like drugs, vice and gambling, which arguably don't have any specific victims. Now, that you may find useful for thinking about these economic crimes and what we can do about the range of them, but also it's sometimes useful just to think, well, how is my role involved in all of those things? Uh, and I'll come to that in a moment. Next slide, please. Now, the latest iteration of um, uh, legislation, and there's some more coming through, and there will soon next month be um, probably published an economic crime uh, strategy um, for the next uh, few years and a, a fraud strategy as well by the UK government. But this piece of legislation sets up a register of overseas entities and their beneficial owners. Um, it makes provision about unexplained wealth orders and makes provisions about sanctions, which as you all know, uh, located as you are uh, close in a way to Russia, uh, close to Libya, um, close to um, the UK as well. Historically, um, uh, you can be used as an intermediary place for setting up uh, companies. And the reason that the UK is uh, or should be anxious about this I'm bearing in mind the time chair, um, is that it's very e cheap and easy to purchase UK companies and other legal entities. So it's not just Cyprus that is under uh, attack by uh, criminals, it's also the UK. Um, and all of this requires uh, customer due diligence of, of beneficial ownership or extra due diligence if the person is actually or or you know that they are a politically exposed person. That's a, a government uh, uh, minister or, or senior civil servant. Um, now, how does this affect professionals? Well, law firms and for that matter, accountancy firms uh, currently have to vet the source of wealth and funds as part of the CDD. And uh, my fellow professionals on the money laundering task force spend a lot of effort trying to work out what is the source of wealth and funds and to verify that. Uh, it depends how far you go back. Uh, if we go back to the early 1990s, um, it could be argued that most Russian and nowadays much Chinese uh, wealth comes from a period where the law was ambiguous, many wrong things were done, whether civil or criminal, almost nobody was sanctioned for any of these things, and therefore it's an area of ambiguity. And the lawyers somehow have to try and get through uh, where the wealth and the, in general and the funds in particular come from whether they are associated with any 
bad actors. Uh, being on the sanctions list or being on uh, some kind of prohibition list is the easy part, although that's actually very difficult, particularly with Islamic names. Um, but um, it, it's a very tricky part of the profession. And sometimes you have to make a judgment call as to how satisfied you're going to be. Uh, the final part of this is unexplained wealth orders and their enforcement problems. Uh, we brought in unexplained wealth orders in a fit of enthusiasm uh, for them. The idea was that we could uh, find if, if, for example, some just to take a hypothetical example, Azerbaijani was involved in allegations of a laundromat uh, of stealing money from the government or people or any other alleged kleptocrat. Uh, then we could go after them with an unexplained wealth order and uh, they would have to, if they couldn't satisfy the court uh, that the wealth was acquired uh, licitly, then that those funds would be uh, confiscated and would be returned perhaps to the country uh, where the money was taken from. In practice, that has been a difficult thing to do. Um, sometimes the uh, the people taking action in the unexplained wealth order uh, may have uh, uh, researched the case not as well as they could have done, and costs are awarded against uh, the government, um, as well as having the embarrassment of the case failing. And that has happened. There have been other cases which have been more successful. I can talk about that um, uh, if you wish, but it's not a core part. So you need to be able to plan for that if you're thinking about similar legislation and to make sure that it's not as easy as it looks either in the UK or in Australia or any other country that has tried this kind of legislation. Next slide, please. And then I'll wind up. Uh, that is just a visual representation of the process and what we're hoping to achieve. What we're hoping to achieve is not just taking more money from offenders or from uh, third parties like uh, law firms or banks who may have been uh, negligent. And you can be targeted uh, innocently by, by structures that look uh, more convincing that they than they are when they're unraveled. Um, but the purpose of this is not just to get more money from offenders and intermediaries, but it's actually to have an impact on crime and its organization. And you can look at that at your leisure, but it's one way of thinking about the process as a whole. Next slide, please. So we now turn to look at the steps needed to foster an institutional anti-crime culture. And I want you to think about what this would look like and how would we recognize success or failure. Success and failure is not binary. It's not one thing or the other. It can be more success or more failure. Um, and the FATF effectiveness model does not focus enough on crime reduction from anti-money laundering. What it tells you to do is you need to do these things. Uh, if you don't, we will uh, uh, give you a bad report um, and that will have economic and social consequences for you. Uh, but the link between anti-money laundering measures and actual reduction of crime is very difficult to establish. So I want you to think about that. And the extension of the anti-money laundering and anti-bribery and corruption regime to the professions and the efforts to harmonize. This in the UK has been difficult. We have a lot of professional bodies. Uh, they are formally supervised by a body called OPBAS, um, which does annual reports. Uh, and tries to harmonize the behavior. But some people have called for the merger of all the professional bodies um, 
into one so that they can be more effectively supervised. I happen to think that's not a very easy idea to put into practice and the result may not be as positive as people think. And this is a lie to criticism of a box ticking compliance culture. There's a huge growth in compliance staff, which is very good news if you want to be employed in this industry. But it's not clear what the effects of this growth in compliance staff are on organized crime. We need to work at that a lot more. And one of the problems is the systemic underinvestment by the public sector in the follow up to suspicious activity reports. Uh, there aren't enough investigators, there aren't enough uh, prosecutors to really make more use of the suspicious activity reports that we have. There are now nearly a million in the UK um, and only a small proportion of them can be seriously looked at. They're still useful because they show um, what um, uh, assets people hold who, who, who are using their real names. Um, and they're good because some law firms, some accountants are uh, not accepting as clients people who in the old days and banks, people in the old days, they would have accepted. But there isn't enough public investment. And that means that the effort put into making SARS is, is sometimes wasted. We also need to focus away from self laundering by predicate offenders like, say, drug dealers, um, uh, thieves, fraudsters, to professional enablers uh, like lawyers uh, and accountants, and to high end money laundering. Uh, it's not usually clear what high end means, um, but. Um, the neglect of local bribery and elite frauds, which if you're trying to justify this to the Cypriot um, uh, population, they want to see action locally against local crimes as well as international crimes. And final point is that resources are finite. We need to prioritize and we need to think about that prioritization process. So I hope that's been of interest and I'll leave you to uh, the other wise people who will follow me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bang on time. Thank you much for your uh, insightful presentation. I would uh, like now to invite Dr. Dimitra uh, Loizu to deliver her presentation. Hello, everyone. Hey, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Let, give me just a second to share my slides. Okay, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, uh, with you this evening. Uh, I do hope that I will uh, add a humble contribution to what uh, Professor Levi has uh, has already covered and what the subsequent speakers will uh, will themselves uh, discuss. And now my um, my presentation uh, will focus on an EU instrument. Uh, the EU directive, the 2018 EU directive on company money laundering um, by criminal law. Um, let me. I think it's better now. Yes, it is. Thank yeah, you. Okay, I think I'm putting it. Okay. Um, by way of introduction, um, I think it is necessary to. Um, outline uh, very briefly the, the, extent of, the extent of the problem uh, that this directive seeks to uh, deal with. Uh, risks of money laundering and the financing of terrorists remain a major concern for the integrity of the EU's financial system and the security of its citizens. Um, just to mention, according to the UN Office on uh, Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, the estimated, and this is just an estimation, uh, the estimated amount of money laundered globally per year is between 2 to 5 percent of the global GDP, or um, money wise, between 800 billion and 2 trillion US dollars. However, as we all know, due to the clandestine nature of money laundering, it is difficult, rather I would say impossible, to estimate 
the actual total amount of money that goes through the laundering cycle. Um, the fight against money laundering and terrorist financing is an important priority for the European Union. And over time, the EU has indeed developed a solid regulatory framework uh, for preventing both uh, money laundering and trade financing in line with international standards, predominantly those adopted by the FATF. However, this um, regulatory framework um, needs to somehow keep pace with the evolving trends, technological developments, and the very ingenuity of criminals to exploit any gaps or loopholes in the system. Uh, the EU has considerably strengthened its legal framework on preventing, let me emphasize the word preventing, uh, money laundering and terrorist financing in recent years. Um, the 2018 directive um, on combating money laundering by means of criminal law does complement uh, the fourth and fifth AML directives, which address prevention of the use of the financial system for the purpose of a money laundering and terrorist financing. The 2018 directive seeks to complement this preventative framework through the criminal law framework uh, by harmonizing what? By harmonizing the definition of the criminal offense of money laundering and related sanctions. Um, and significantly, what does what does um, the directive establish? What does it bring about? It establishes a minimum rules concerning the definition of criminal offenses and sanctions in this area. However, the member states do remain free to adopt or maintain more stringent criminal law rules, including broader definitions of offenses and harsher sanctions. Now, the directive was adopted uh, in October 2018 uh, with a deadline for its transposition the 3rd of December 2020. Cyprus wanted uh, Cyprus to um, uh, follow uh, this development. Cyprus transposed the directive in March 2021 with the adoption of an amending legislation, legislation uh, 21 of 2021, which, trans which amended um, the key uh, anti-money laundering legislation in Cyprus, the Prevention and Suppression of Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Law of 2007. Yeah, so what, our transposition of the directive in the Cypriot legal order came a bit uh, late. Um, now, by way of background, why was the adoption uh, of the directive deemed necessary? There were significant problems, uh, among others, when it came to effective prosecutions and cooperation among member states, as a result of the significant divergence in the criminal laws of member states. Certain member states pursued what we refer to as an all crimes approach, where any criminal offense was a predicate offense related to money laundering, while other member states provided for a finite um, list of offenses. Now, what are the key changes which have been introduced? First of all, we have a definition of those criminal offenses and sanctions in the area of money laundering. And their aim is to uh, obviously facilitate police and judicial cooperation between EU member states. And as a result, uh, to prevent criminals from taking advantage of more lenient legal systems. Uh, the directive uh, criminalizes money laundering when it has been committed intentionally and with the knowledge that the property came from criminal activity. A uh, significant uh, property, um, and this is uh, defining the directive itself, means assets of any kind, whether physical or virtual, movable or immovable, tangible or intangible, a legal uh, document in any form, including electronic or digital ones. Uh, the preamble of the directive makes specific reference to virtual currencies and the new risks and challenges that they present in the fight against um, money laundering. To this effect, um, member states should ensure that such risks are dealt with appropriately in the framework of the directive. Uh, interestingly, uh, the provisions of the directive also allow member states to criminalize money laundering where the offender suspected or 
ought to have known that the property came from criminal activity. This is what we otherwise refer to as negligent money laundering. Negligent money laundering is made optional by the directive, and Cyprus has incorporated this option in its national legislation. Now, the next part of the presentation is very important uh, in order to understand the way that the directive operates in practice. Um, essentially, the commission of money laundering by means of criminal law involves three key stages, three key elements. A criminal uh, activity that is a predicate offense. Uh, we need to have property which is derived from this criminal activity. And such property is the subject of money laundering, the criminal offense. Now, what is a criminal activity or otherwise called a predicate offense? And this will take me to our next uh, slide. Uh, for the purposes of this directive, um, the following contact um, is considered to be a criminal activity, i.e. contact, which is relevant for the crime of money laundering. First of all, any kind of criminal involvement in the commissioning of an offence, which is punishable in accordance with the national law, by prison or on detention, which will have a maximum and a minimum penalty for a minimum of more than six months or a maximum of more than one year. And insofar as not already covered by the first category, offenses within a list of 22 designated categories of crime, including those offenses defined in EU legislation as set out in the directive. Significantly, the directive widens the scope of predicate offenses, and within each category, a range of offenses is included. 22 predicate offenses are introduced, including cyber crime and environmental crimes. And the inclusion of cyber crime is um, quite significant since this is the first time it has been featured in the context of an EU money laundering directive. If we have a look at Article 2 of the directive, um, we can see a comprehensive list as to what may constitute a predicate offense for money laundering. So we have the usual suspect, terrorists, human trafficking, sexual exploitation, um, drug trafficking, and then we also have illicit arms trafficking, corruption, fraud, counterfeiting of currency and counterfeiting uh, price of products, environmental crime, which I just mentioned, um, murder and GPH, kidnapping, um, and skim through them, robbery of theft, smuggling, tax crimes interesting related to both direct and indirect taxes, extortion, forgery, piracy, insider trading and market manipulation, and cyber crime. So we have a, a long list of offenses, and within each one, we have a range of offenses. Um, <coughs> uh, apologies. Several of uh, these offenses are, um, let me go to my previous slide, several of these offenses are defined in EU legislation itself. For example, according to the directive, terrorism includes any offense set out in the Anti-Terrorist Directive of 2017. And it includes offenses such as receiving and uh, providing training for the purpose of terrorism. Another example would be cybercrime, which includes any offense set out in the EU Directive on attacks against information systems. Such serious uh, criminal offenses, which are already the subject of regulation at the EU level, should be implemented in national legislation by the EU member state. The property which arises as a result of these criminal activities will be punishable as a money laundering offense if it falls under the terms of Article uh, 3 of uh, the directive. According to Article 3.1, and the following, and again, um, we need to bear in mind that intention is always required. So the following contact is a money laundering offense if committed intentionally. First of all, we have a transferring or converting property, knowing that it came from criminal activity for the purpose of concealing or disguising its illicit origin or helping someone out which was involved in the illicit activity to evade the legal consequence of their action. And secondly, we have concealing or disguising the true nature, source, location, and so on of property, again, knowing 
study chain from criminal activity. Lastly, we have the acquisition, possession, or use of property, knowing at the time that it was received, again, that it had come from a criminal activity. Member states must ensure that persons who committed or were involved in the commission of money laundering offenses are subject to punishment. In particular, member states must take the necessary measures to ensure that criminal liability also extends to those who launder the process of their own crimes, what we refer to as self-laundering. Self-laundering extends to some, but not all money laundering offenses. It does not cover the offenses uh, that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago under point C. That is uh, when the offender acquired, possessed, or used property, knowing that at the time it was received, that it had come from uh, a criminal activity. Certain uh, factors that will hinder efficient prosecution are also uh, dealt with. In this context, uh, the directive foresees, for example, that a previous or simultaneous conviction for the criminal activity from which the property was derived is not a prerequisite for a conviction for money laundering. Secondly, it is possible to convict without needing to establish all the facts or all the circumstances about the criminal activity, including the identity of the perpetrator. Uh, the offenses extend to property derived from property in another EU member state or a non-EU uh, country where it would be considered criminal activity had it occurred domestically. With respect to this requirement, member states uh, may further require that the relevant contact is also a criminal offense under the national law of another member state or a third country. However, it is not possible for member states to implement this exception as regards um, organized crime, terrorism, human trafficking and migrant smuggling, sexual exploitation, drug trafficking and corruption. And notably, Cyprus has chosen not to make use uh, of this exception. Uh, also in the context of the 2018 directive, the member states are also obliged to take the necessary measures to ensure uh, that certain circumstances are regarded as aggravating uh, circumstances, that is, circumstances which make the uh, commission of offenses more serious. Uh, aggravated circumstances include instances where the offense was committed within the framework of a criminal organization as defined in the relevant framework uh, decision, or where the offender uh, committed the offense when carrying out their professional activities as obliged entities as defined in Article 2 of the Fourth AML Directive. Member states may also, and um, this is an option provided in the directive, it is not obligatory, may also choose to regard the following as aggravating circumstances, where the laundered property is of considerable value or where the laundered property comes from the crimes which I mentioned a while ago, organized crime, terrorism, human trafficking and migrant smuggling, sexual exploitation, drug trafficking and corruption. Cyprus has transposed both of these um, optional uh, requirements. In any case, uh, according to the terms of the directive, member states are now obliged to criminalize aiding, abetting, inciting, and attempting to commit a money laundering offense pursuant to Article 4 of the directive. And now, what is the situation with respect to penalties and sanctions? Um, in terms of penalties for natural persons, the directive provides that this should be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. I should have proceeded to my next slide, apologies. Uh, the directive uh, seeks to achieve more consistency across member states by increasing the punishment for money laundering to at least four years in prison. Now, what is the situation with respect to illegal persons? Um, criminal liability is extended to legal persons where the offense is committed for the benefit of a legal person, either by a person having a leading position within the legal person, or where the criminal activity was the result of the lack of supervision or control by that person. 
liability of legal persons does not, however, exclude the prosecution of individual perpetrators or accessories. Significantly, the liability of legal persons may involve both criminal or non-criminal fines or other sanctions, and these are set out in the directive. For example, we can have temporary or permanent exclusion from access to public funding, temporary or permanent disqualification from the practice of uh, commercial activities, judicial winding up, and others. That is, criminal liability per se for legal entities is not required. A uh, related to the member state must take the necessary measures to ensure the freezing or confiscation of the proceeds of crime in accordance with the relevant EU directive. The directive further clarifies the jurisdictional framework of the money laundering offences. A member state is obliged to establish jurisdiction over offences committed on its territory on the basis of the territoriality principle and over offences committed by its nationals pursuant to the active personality principle. A member state can extend its jurisdiction with respect to money laundering offences which have been committed outside its territory where the offender is a habitual resident on its territory or where the offence is committed for the benefit of a legal person established on its territory. Cyprus has not relied on either of these two options. Uh, further, the directive provides for clearer rules aimed at resolving cases of conflicts of jurisdiction where the money laundering offences fall within the jurisdiction of more than one member state. The objective here is to centralise proceedings in a single member state. In this context, the directive provides for a list of factors to be taken into account, as some of them will be um, the territory of the member state on which the offence was committed, the nationality or residency of the offender, and others where uh, appropriate Europol is to be involved. Now, lastly, let me provide some concluding comments. I'm not sure how well I'm going with my uh, time. Uh, overall, uh, the directive established minimum rules for criminal liability for money laundering offences by, among others, harmonising the definition of money laundering and predicate offences, imposing minimum sanctions, and extending criminal liability to legal persons. One of the key aspects of the directive is the harmonization of the definition of what constitutes a money laundering offense. And the importance of this fact is that with this harmonization, uh, the EU will come clo close um, to closing some of the loopholes of interpretation between the different member states' domestic legislation, making the fight against money launderers more homogeneous and efficient. Uh, at the same time, I think it is, in, and in the context of uh, today's webinar, I think it is important to acknowledge and place this directive uh, within the broader international EU and national legal frameworks um, with respect to the fight against transnational uh, crimes. Uh, in this respect, um, confronting the link between money laundering and other illicit activities is of utmost importance. And it is for this reason that its introduction is so great relevance for professionals, whether they're working in the public or private sectors, um, who have a role to play uh, in the fight against uh, transnational economic crimes and other crimes as well. And I would like to thank you for your patience, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Laser. It was uh, very interesting to hear about the directive and the recent updates. <laughs> Um, I'm sure there will be questions at the end. May I ask uh, Mr. Christian Pelagias to deliver his uh, presentation? Uh, I think you are on mute, uh, Mr. Pelagias. There we go. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, I uh, thank you to the organizers. It's, uh, I'm glad to be back here again. Um, and uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, congratulate the two previous speakers. Uh, you've basically taken about 60% of my presentation, but it's absolutely fine. <laughs> it was a real pleasure hearing it. And, and uh, so I'm going to, uh, rather than uh, repeating uh, certain things, I'm going to be focusing a bit more uh, towards the end of my uh, presentation, where I'm hoping to be 
uh, a bit provocative uh, in order to uh, for us to um, uh, generate a bit more of a discussion uh, later on. Um, uh, the, let me just see if I can uh, get my slides up real quick. I think the, 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 our first speaker uh, defined uh, transnational and economic crime uh, extremely well. Uh, and uh, the question is obviously, uh, if, we, if we look at, you know, I've used the same definitions and so on. Uh, now, uh, as, as also was mentioned, there are different forms of transnational organized crime, uh, various types of sort of criminal activities that uh, on, a, on a global scale, uh, where uh, money laundering becomes, um, I mean, there are, there are different, which was also mentioned, there are different ways of tackling it. You know, global, local coordination, education, awareness, development uh, in intelligence and technology. But more importantly, there is a need for effective legislation of, and, 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 and the need for an efficient judiciary in order to handle these uh, matters on, on, on sort of both on a national level, but also on an international level. And the money, you know, anti-money laundering uh, 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 procedures and its prevention plays a, a large part of this, as we just heard the previous speaker excellently pointing out that there are new legislation coming out. These legislation, and I've, I've just taken the liberty sort of listing, you know, for the last 34 years, uh, we've seen uh, an increase of uh, you know uh, legislation developing from. Uh, a set of original guidelines from the OECD and the Financial Action Task Force being adopted by the European Union, and then even more, uh, you know, as as we go by, these uh, these rules changes, uh, you know, continuously and will continue to do so. The more uh, this uh, the 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 efforts of using money laundering prevention in combating transnational crime and I, I, I believe that this is where uh, money laundering uh, prevention really comes into play is uh, being one of the, uh, the front uh, methodologies and tools in order to combat transnational crime. The problem with transnational crime though is or any type of criminal activity is that you can, the question is can you really beat it? You know, can you ever eradicate crime? Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, I think that's a that's a, that's a wishful thinking. Uh, can you eradicate it on an international level? Well, the more globalized we become, the more international crime will become, and the more uh, uh, cross-border uh, aspects it 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 will take. So uh, I don't think that we will ever be able to find a a, a legislation or a, a, a method that that will uh, that will be able to uh, to combat it. Uh, the figures that we've mentioned uh, re, uh, before by the previous speaker, uh, I think it was something to the effect of uh, 1.6 trillion and sort of uh, you know 2.5 percent of GDP uh, is is uh, is um, uh, represents sort of the, the global uh, exposure to to money laundering and, and international crime uh, in uh, 2020 2021 uh, in 2009 that figure was 100 and, uh, 870 billion uh, so the figure has definitely gone up now why is that uh, the more legislation we have it seems that it's just rising now either that is because it's be we're becoming more aware of it uh, or is there, a, or or is it just that this is becoming such a a, a a more globalized phenomenon than what it usually be? The more integrated we become, the more technology advanced we become, uh, the more of an issue it it uh, it, it develops into. Um, but uh, there are uh, certain uh, concerns and problems that obviously have arisen also when we're talking about using. Money laundering as a as a, as a anti money laundering as an as a um, as a uh, prevention method when it comes to transnational uh, crimes, 
And the first is that these legislations are predominantly based on guidelines aimed on tackling a global phenomenon. So, uh, you know, the intention is to create a widespread global approach to transnational crime and how to deal with it. There are certain guidelines that could be that should be followed in order to tackle these issues, but it all depends on how they're being implemented, depending on what part of the world you are. Uh, so, for example, Asia has the uh, according to the the, the organized crime uh, global organized crime index, uh, Asia is uh, the continent that has the highest level of uh, of organized crime. It also has the lowest uh, efficiency rate of combating organized crime, followed by Africa and then America and then Europe and last, uh, you know, indefinitely least, uh, smallest is the oceanic countries. So globally, you could say, yes, you, Europe has been very efficient in that sense that it has taken these guidelines, they've implemented more rigorous sort of standardized uh, legislation. Uh, but this also creates a problem because these legislation are usually standardized and then distributed amongst the member states within the EU to be implemented. The only way that they can work is if they're implemented on a standardized scale, namely that every country adopts them similarly. But they're not. There is a big difference between how this legislation is adopted, let's say, in Cyprus and uh, you know, in the in, in the United Kingdom, or even in in countries like Sweden, where I I I, I have a lot of experience. Uh, so even the 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 way that these things are addressed are uh, are uh, are uh, are different depending on which country you look at within the European Union. Uh, there are different reasons for that. There are cultural reasons. There are. Uh, the, the, the general sort of perception that, uh, as was mentioned before, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have these types of problems and therefore we don't need to take them that seriously. Uh, or our financial system uh, is uh, is not affected about it, uh, of it or, or so on and so on. Uh, but it does create the problem because as, f as the more these legislations are, con are changing and being amended, uh, you know, countries fall behind in in their implementation, and that has also to do with the fact that uh, you have an adoption among multiple industries. Uh, a lawyer applies anti-money laundering legislation and, 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 and procedures very differently from a bank. You cannot have a standardized approach to this to these issues. A bank will address it. From a banking perspective, a lawyer will address it from a from a lawyer, lawyer's perspective, and therefore uh, there are multiple concerns which have to be taken in consideration when you adopt this legislation. This causes a problem uh, because that gives you a, a discrepancy on how it's being implemented, and therefore the banks will ask for something, the lawyers will ask for, for another, and eventually, uh, unfortunately, as we've seen, or at least in, in my opinion. Uh, the legal profession has been uh, been forced on the back foot when it comes to this, especially when it uh, relates to client confidentiality and 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 and, and other issues like that. Uh, now, you, a lot of these uh, legislations also, and let's not forget uh, that they are used to achieve political policies, and this is also a problem because you're not are you really tackling what the real issue is, or are you simply implementing these vast legislations in order to sort of satisfy the various powers that be in Brussels and whatnot. Uh, you know, if, if you ever had the opportunity of working in the European Commission, this is, uh, which I have, uh, this is usually the case. Uh, there are many agendas involved uh, and, and a lot of them may not necessarily take individual countries' concerns uh, uh, into consideration when these legislations are being adopted. Uh, and one of these examples is the, 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 the wide, uh, previously wide and, and still continuing uh, wide uh, definition of what a predicate offense is. It's sort of, you know, almost opening the floodgates to any type of criminal activity. 
uh, that also can be considered to be non and honor. It has a logic aspect on one hand, but at the same time, you also have conflicts and, 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 and collisions with various other types of legislations. And from at least from a legal standpoint, this creates a problem because it also comes down to the question of proportionality. Uh, the principle of proportionality is 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 still uh, uh, you know one of the most fundamental guiding principles within 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 law and and the, you have to start raising the questions are these legislation pieces of legislation and these obligations that they impl that they enforce uh, really proportionate of what they're trying to, or what they want to achieve uh, and one of the one of the the key sort of areas, at least in my opinion, where where this has shown is the question of transparency versus privacy. Uh, and we saw this, for example, uh, in the the uh, two uh, Euro uh, European uh, Court of Justice cases uh, late last year. Um, uh, who, that was referred from Luxembourg concerning the ultimate beneficial ownership registry and the question whether or not uh, making these, pub, pub, these, these registries public uh, is in conform uh, or conform with European law and, 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 uh, and, uh, and human rights. And it proved that it was not. And therefore, it raises additional questions of, you know, how if 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 this and there were many who said that at that point that were oh this will this will set us back uh, many 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 years in in combating money laundering and and the, and the, and the drive towards transparency well maybe that's not such a bad thing after all because perhaps what really needs to be done if we're really serious of having legal frameworks that are are, are efficient in combating uh, uh, transnational crime. They also need to be very carefully thought through and very carefully implemented in order so that they don't uh, violate the rights of the individual. Uh, and I think this is, as we move forward, uh, this is going to be an increasingly uh, an increasing concern, and I believe we will see more court cases on this issue. And uh, I believe that the you know the the, the debate on this uh, will continue um, uh, as as we see more legislation being put into practice. Uh, I think those are my uh, two cents on the matters, as they say. And uh, I hope that uh, this will uh, have generated some um, uh, some uh, uh, additional. Uh, questions for, for our discussion uh, and comments for our discussions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pelagias. Um, I would uh, like to invite our last uh, speaker for tonight, Dr. Clarkos Kiriakidis. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I echo what has been said uh, in thanking the previous speakers, what I would like to do now is hopefully share my screen. So can you confirm whether you can see my screen with the yes, title? Yeah, good, here we can. Good. Yes. Thank you. I had 20 minutes or so, and what I would like to do is turn our attention to the issue of good governance. And in that context, the importance or indeed the criticality of culture. What I would like to do, uh, I'll just make clear at the very outset, is that I'm going to race through um, quite a detailed slide presentation, which I've made uh, available for everybody in the, uh, the Microsoft Teams folder. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to try and do is uh, address a number of questions and advance an argument and i've been thinking about this for some time that this is what my argument boils down to or this is what my thesis boils down to e economic crime is likely to flourish if the rule of law is routinely flouted amid any transnational national or institutional culture which is steeped with impropriety willful blindness the covering up of the truth or impunity 
I've written that really after living in the Eastern Mediterranean for seven years or so, after living in the United Kingdom for 45 years or so. I probably wouldn't have written that 10 years ago, but now that I've lived in the Eastern Mediterranean for so long and seen so much systemic impropriety, willful blindness, uh, covering up of the truth and impunity, I've, I've sort of reached this conclusion. It, it's not just applicable to economic crime, it's also applicable to other areas of crime as well. The, the problem is that any such state of affairs will, will inevitably benefit criminals, or alleged criminals, uh, as well as those who consider themselves to be above the law, those who can pull strings for improper purposes, and those who stand to gain from any failure of the law enforcement authorities to enforce the law. Again, that's a product of living in the Eastern Mediterranean. But the more that time goes by, and the more that I read and the more that I see, I'm becoming drawn to the conclusion that this thesis that I'm advancing is as applicable uh, to the United Kingdom as it is to the, the Republic of Cyprus. I mean, that's a controversial proposition, but I, I will put it forward today. I have to give credit to Jonathan Goldsmith uh, for an article he wrote in the Law Society Gazette a few days ago because he drew my attention to the following quotation from the Venice Commission, which is surely uh, spot on. Although full enforcement of the rule of law is rarely possible, a fundamental requirement of the rule of law is that the law must be respected. This means in particular that state bodies must effectively implement laws. The very essence of the rule of law would be called into question if law appeared only in the books, but were not duly applied and enforced. This is the problem, one of the fundamental problems that we appear to have in the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly in places such as Greece, Turkey, and the Republic of Cyprus, uh, which constitute the southeast edge of Europe, or at the very least the southeast edge of uh, the Council of Europe collectively. But they're, they're also applicable uh, uh, elsewhere, I would suggest, regrettably. Economic crime, let me just go one step further, may be confronted energetically, or it can never be eliminated as has already been indicated, if a number of things happen. Chief among these, perhaps, is that the rule of law must exist in practice. The rule of law must be properly and widely understood as well as respected. And that the rule of law is effectively reinforced by good governance at all levels of society and by citizens with sufficient incomes, integrity, individual responsibility, self-discipline, a sense of civic duty, the ability to engage in independent critical thinking and the willingness to exhibit moral courage by, for example, blowing the whistle uh, in a lawful manner. That's all easier said than done. but. Again, having lived in the Eastern Mediterranean for, for seven years or so, that this is absolutely essential because if these principles and ideas do not exist in practice, one ends up with societies where one is bedeviled by systemic forms of illegality, impropriety, impunity, and so on. Now, I won't read the, 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 the slides which follow, but I'll, I'll just flag up the issues that they raise. Uh, it's already been pointed out in this webinar that economic crime has attracted a number of different definitions. Well, this is the definition which the uh, Crown, uh, not the Crown, the uh, UK government has uh, put forward in a, a policy paper published on the 18th of January 1923. Economic crime, it states, it refers to a broad category of activity involving money, finance or assets, the purpose of which is to unlawfully obtain a profit or advantage for the perpetrator or to cause loss uh, to others. So that, that is, is in, in, in a sentence, the UK government's approach to what is meant by economic crime. And let me just stress here that in England, at least, 
the um, phrase economic crime has come to the fore to eclipse the related uh, phrase financial crime. And it's come to the fore in part because of legislation such as the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act 2002. The same uh, UK government uh, policy paper lists some of the main acts of parliament and regulations which provide the, the legislative framework uh, around which the confrontation of economic crime takes place. And there you can see, for example, the Proceeds of Crime Act uh, 2002 and the money laundering uh, regulations from 2017. There is also in this statutory framework a succession of acts of parliament that have been introduced uh, since uh, 2015, including the Serious Crime Act, the uh, Criminal Finances Act and the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act, together with the, the, the Economic Crime Act that I mentioned a moment or two ago. So what one has in, in, in England and to a considerable extent, as I understand it, uh, in the United Kingdom, of which England forms part, is a pretty vast, pretty robust and pretty comprehensive economic crime or anti-economic crime framework. The problem, the problem is, and I'll just touch on this and a little bit later on, is the uneven application of this law and what appears to have been systemic failings on the part of the UK government and the UK authorities to um, clamp down on the infiltration of the economy by foreign entities, foreign individuals and others who have brought in, to use the, the phrase, dirty money. I'll come to, I'll come to that point uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, time allowing. There is, in, in English law, a uh, well there's no there's no um well there there is a money laundering act uh, it's called the proceeds of crime act and the, the the explanatory notes provide a definition of what is meant by money laundering it's the process by which the proceeds of crime are converted into assets which appear to have a legitimate origin so that they can be retained permanently or recycled into further criminal enterprises. The explanatory notes, of course, dovetail with the statutory approach to money laundering in the Proceeds of Crime Act. And you can see there the, the various uh, um, offences embodied within the Proceeds of Crime Act, or some of those offences summarised in Section 340 of the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. And I've given you also on the slides some uh, approaches to money laundering set out uh, in the courts. I wanted to just flag up how, that our preoccupation with economic crime should not lead us to overlook the adverse implications of economic crime for other areas of law. It's likely, for example, that if uh, a trustee commits a crime uh, that falls within the definition of an economic crime, that crime is likely to constitute a breach of trust for the purposes of the relevant case law or for the purposes of the Trustee Act 2000. Equally, a company director who engages in or allegedly engages in uh, economic crime is likely to be in breach of the director's duties provisions in the Companies Act 2006. So the point I wanted to make here is that our preoccupation with economic crime and its consequences in the criminal sphere should not uh, lead us to overlook the risks involved in infringing other areas of law. And I've listed there for you some of the, the, the websites that are freely available to enable you to, to dig into the uh, the case law of England and Wales and the uh, the regulatory decisions by the the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal. The the UK government in its list earlier failed to specify some of the other very very important acts of Parliament that fall within the general framework of economic crime, and these include the Theft Act, uh, 1968 
I've referred there to section one, but another very important section is section 17, which criminalizes false accounting. And then we have various uh, revenue law acts of parliament, which which prohibit various forms of, of tax evasion, such as the Taxes and Management Act 1970 that uh, confronts the fraudulent evasion of income tax. Let me now in, in the last few minutes just flag up uh, the this new Act of Parliament that's already been mentioned, the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act 2002. This enables me to discuss the concept uh, of culture. When the, the then bill, the bill being the instrument that preceded the Act, when the then bill was presented to the House of Commons on the 7th of March 2022, the then uh, Home Secretary Priti Patel MP uh, explained that the, the, the bill was a response to what she called Putin's horrific unjust war on Ukraine. She went on to allege that Putin is a gangster and his regime is underpinned by a mob of oligarchs and kleptocrats who have abused his uh, the financial system and the rule of law for too long. She then, um, I had to stress here, benefiting from parliamentary privilege. She then um, added Putin's cronies, and she admitted this, this is an admission on behalf of the UK government, Putin's cronies have hidden dirty money in the UK and across the West, and we do not want it here. Expediting this legislation, which I know the whole house supports, will mean that we can crack down on the people who abuse the UK's open society. The problem is, for the last 30 years or so, since the downfall of the Soviet Union and the emergence of the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom and other European states, including the, the Republic of Cyprus, have been um, posing up to uh, um, one Russian president after another. Yeltsin, then, Med uh, then Putin, then Medvedev, then Putin again. And we're now facing the the, the shocking consequences of, of this sort of failure of governance, I would suggest, from the top down. We tend to focus in, in anti-crime, quite rightly, on the essential need for good governance at an institutional level, whether it's in, the, in a, a particular public body or a particular company. But the problem that one also faces, and this is something that troubles me as somebody who teaches people who, who, who may enter the legal profession, is that we may be operating in a society in which wrongdoing is facilitated by the state. That's particularly the case in various parts of the Eastern Mediterranean, where the state itself is or appears to be responsible for wrongdoing on a grand scale. But increasingly, we're seeing it in, in the United Kingdom. And I'll give you just so, some examples here. We were cozying up to, uh, to Russia when we knew that, or when there was evidence to suggest that a lot of the money that was flowing in to England, and primarily England, because uh, that's where the city of London is and where the, the biggest or the most expensive properties tend to be. We really turned a blind eye to lots and lots of dirty money flowing into England, as well as other parts of the United Kingdom. This is this pattern has been played out in the Republic of Cyprus as well. But I just flag up these photographs that, that make my point for me. We, we really did cozy up to uh, the Russian the Russian state at a time when vast sums of what appear to have been dirty money were pouring in. And eventually the truth gradually came to light, partly through uh, the report of the UK Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee under the chairmanship of a former attorney general in a report that was uh, completed in 2019, but um, was not released to the public until um, the 21st of July 2020. And it concluded, among other things, that the UK welcomed Russian money for many years, and few questions, if any, were asked about the provenance of this considerable wealth. In brief, Russian influence in the UK is the new normal, and there are a lot of Russians with very close links to Putin who are very well integrated into the UK business and social scene and accepted because of their wealth. This level of integration in London Grad in particular 
means that any measures now being taken by the government are not preventative, but rather constitute damage limitation. And what am I driving at here? What I'm driving at is that the response that we've seen since Russia prepared to reinvade Ukraine in February 2022, and then after Russia uh, initiated its invasion, it's damage limitation. Prime Minister Johnson referred to the measures that he was introducing back in February 2020 as a draconian package of sanctions. And it, in the light of, uh, of the invasion, these sanctions were brought in uh, to uh, an extraordinary extent. At the same time, you can read the slides in your own time, the Economic Trium Transparency and Enforcement Act was rushed through the, the House of Commons and it has a number of, of aims, one of which is to establish a register of overseas entities. That register has now come into effect. The, uh, uh, registrable overseas entities, if I've got the phrase correct, registrable overseas entities, uh, in other words, to give you the, the most obvious example, foreign companies owning property in one of the four countries of the United Kingdom or under an obligation to register with Companies House, including uh, with details of their registrable beneficial owners by the 31st of January 2023. So the deadline has passed and I was somewhat um, shocked. <laughs> I had to use the verb uh, or the word shocked to discover that um, according to the UK government's uh, estimates, only 60%, 60% of the um, registered overseas organisations have actually declared their beneficial owners within the, uh, the, 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 the legal deadline. 19,510 out of 32,440 registered overseas organisations have declared their beneficial owners. So the legislation has not been universally uh, complied with, it would appear, and Companies House is now preparing cases for enforcement action. I'm going to just finish. Uh, uh, um, could the chair just tell me how long I have left, and I'll, I'll make sure that I, I wind down. You still have you another still have two two minutes, but Thank you. Uh, there is a few minutes more, uh, if you like. Well, yeah, I'll, if, if, if I'll take three minutes and just make sure that, okay. that you 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 um, draw me to a close when I've exceeded the three minutes. What I wanted to now just emphasise is that this picture that I've played of um, kowtowing to the the Kremlin, turning a blind eye to billions and billions and billions, it seems, of dirty money pouring into the UK. It's been, it appears to have been mirrored in the Republic of Cyprus at the other end of, of Europe. Uh, and here, therefore, we have two very interesting parallel stories at opposite ends of Europe with very similar uh, phenomena. Uh, just by way of, of background, I just remind everybody that the Republic of Cyprus has very close ties to the United Kingdom to crown dependencies such as Jersey, to various British overseas territories, uh, to Turkey, which is the occupying power in the north of the Republic, and to Russia, which uh, to make things uh, uh, even more unsettling is, is busily constructing a nuclear power plant 110 kilometers north of Nicosia in Turkey. I, I've just uh, written an article on that. I've I, I flagged it up on the slide there um, to make my point. Um, so it's backfired. This whole strategy of kowtowing to the Kremlin and cozying up to the Kremlin, it's kowtowed. It's, it didn't start with President Christofias, but it arguably accelerated with him. He was a Moscow-educated communist, um, um, advocate fan of uh, Lenin, and he was um, somebody who was a it appears to have been exceptionally close to the Kremlin during his presidency from 2008 to 2013. But things didn't uh, change when he left office under a supposed free market capitalist. President Anastasiadis took over in 2013. Uh, Russia then invaded Ukraine in 2014. The US imposed sanctions. The EU uh, imposed sanctions. And since Brexit, the UK imposed sanctions on on Russia. But it didn't change 
the the sort of approach of the the government of the republic uh the since 2014 we've had a series of bilateral meetings including this one in 2015 so this is after the original russian invasion of ukraine there was another one in 2019 and there was another one involving mr lavrov uh, the foreign minister of russia visiting in september 2020 my point is my point is here we have arguably an example of bad governance at a national level from the top down that created the culture and the conditions for vast sums of money to pour out of Russia, come into the Republic of Cyprus and then exit uh, Cyprus and go back to Russia through one way or the other. And it's really quite astonishing that if you look at the uh, US State Department uh, investment climate statements for uh, uh, inward and outward direct investment with regard to Russia, Cyprus is top of the table. It, it really is quite astonishing. There are 196 or so member states of the UN and Cyprus is in gold medal position as regards uh, this particular feature of, of the Russian economy. And if you look at it the other way around, as far as uh, Cyprus is concerned, Russia is in, in gold medal position. Th these statistics I'm showing you, they're from the post-2014 period. So this is after the US-led invasion uh, of Ukraine. And what you also find in the British, it, sorry, not the British, the, the Cypriot economic uh, structure is a very close relationship with uh, crown dependencies such as Jersey and British overseas territories such as the British Virgin Islands, as well as Bermuda and, of course, the UK itself. Let me stress much of this money will be legitimate and above board and clean. But the question arises as to how much of this money uh, is dirty and what the authorities have done. The backlash now encompasses uh, arrest warrants that have been issued against Mr. Putin uh, for uh, various alleged international crimes. So that brings me now to the end of this presentation. We have what I've tried to do in the last few minutes is flag up the importance of good governance at both national level and institutional level, whether it's at public body level or uh, company level or in, uh, at any form of entity level at the, gra at the grassroots of society. What needs to happen to change things? Well, I've flagged up in this uh, last uh, uh, pair of slides some ideas. Um, perhaps let me just focus on a, a couple of these. Number three, normalised abnormality must end. And that's what we've been having in both the United Kingdom and the Republic of Cyprus. We had, va we appear to have had vast sums of dirty money pouring into the United Kingdom at one end of Europe the Republic of Cyprus at the other end of Europe and far too many people in far too many places were closing their eyes and shutting their, their ears. So normalised abnormality must end. And uh, right at the top, number four, a joined up approach is essential. Anti-corruption and more generally anti-crime laws, policies, procedures and controls must go hand in hand with laws, policies, procedures in, and controls in related fields such as those concerning an alphabetical order, anti-bribery, anti-bullying and harassment, anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, cyber security, data protection, freedom of information, record keeping, risk management, whistleblowing and witness protection. There is a tendency to treat each of these areas as distinct. My argument is they are interconnected with one another and that requires every entity in the private the public sector or elsewhere to adopt a holistic approach to give you one very simple example it's no good having a whistleblowing policy in place and in the republic of cyprus that is going to have to become part of the way of operating now that belatedly whistleblowing legislation uh, has entered the, uh, the, the the legislative framework of the Republic. There's no point having a whistleblowing policy in place and on paper if it's not supplemented and if it's not integrated into the anti-bullying and harassment policy, because 
often the people who should be blowing the whistle are not blowing the whistle because they are subject to bullying and harassment. We know that, for example, from the Francis inquiry into the Mid-Staffordshire NHS trust scandal in the United Kingdom in a, in a different uh, area that's to do with, with, with health care. But the point comes across from the, the report of Robert Francis QC, as he then was when he completed the report uh, in various phases in 2010 uh, and 2013, if I remember correctly. I've, I've finished my presentation with some uh, reading that you're welcome to conduct. In addition to the sources that I've already sort of cited, all of the sources that I've, I've placed on the screen are freely available online. They include various publications of the House of Commons Library, um, an analysis by the Law Society and the um, legal guidance that has been published by the Crown Prosecution Service also on my list is the uh, the guidance for the legal sector in England and Wales, I stress, but many lawyers around the world might find that uh, guidance of interest and of help in terms of understanding uh, the anti-money laundering framework in England and Wales. I, re I remind you that because of devolution, Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own separate parliaments and governments and court systems. So that brings me uh, to an end. I thank you for your patience and I will now stop sharing the screen, I hope. I'll manage to do that. All right, Ari, do you want to say a few words or should I kick in? Uh, I think uh, we had very interesting uh, presentations on, on, the, on the topic of uh, AML. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, questions that uh, our participants would like to address to the, to the speakers. And I think I'll give the floor to you in order to coordinate the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Uh... Mr. Chair, thank you to the speakers for the very interesting uh, insights into the world of uh, AML and money laundering. I have a couple of points as the discussion for tonight, but um, then uh, I will be relaying to you questions and comments from the chat or from the uh, audience. We already have a couple of points in the chat. But to start with, I had a couple of points for all of you. And uh, I very much enjoyed the order of the presentations, I have to say. Uh, thanks to Professor uh, Levy, we were able to, uh, well, to dive deep into uh, the meaning of, um, of a transnational organized crime or the meanings with an S. Um, so we were able to look into the UK framework, but also uh, Professor Levy was uh, kind enough to share with us a few of his insights uh, of his work at the international level. I think it was the OECD, if I'm not mistaken. So that's uh, very interesting. And um, this is something that you have in common with Clarkos in the way, you know, uh, you, you put um, transnational economic crime into the broader picture of international relations, which of course uh, explains a, a lot of things. And then we were very lucky to be able to, uh, thanks to Dimitra, to uh, uh, well to understand better the EU framework around money laundering and its implementation in a spe specific member state, which is Cyprus, which was, I think, very, very interesting. Uh, to look into the various definitions and the various uh, scopes and remits of the provisions. Uh, and uh, Christian came to reinforce the point of uh, what Professor Levy actually had uh, pointed out and then uh, and Claire Hoss continued or confirmed, which is this uh, uh, idea of, uh, you know, an uh, anti-money uh, laundering uh, culture or anti-crime culture. So. I just want to make a couple of points and then uh, I will give you the floor back to the speakers. And um, I want also wanted to refer to a few of the instruments we have at the international or regional level, which is relevant to the discussion, because, of course, uh, despite um, the picture painted 
uh, we should remember, or we should remind ourselves that uh, countries like the UK or Cyprus are members to most of the international conventions uh, dealing with transna transnational organized crime. And particularly, uh, I wanted to mention uh, a convention that both Dimitra and I know quite well because we were trained on it, which is the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, but there is an equivalent at the Council of Europe level, which is called the Warsaw Convention. Um, again, it's a conference of the parties uh, to the Council of Europe on um, convention on laundering, search, seizure and confiscation of the proceeds from crime and on the financing of terrorism. Uh, we also have at the Council of Europe level a, a convention on criminal law uh, and corruption which is worth mentioning here. And of course, the work both of Greco and Monival is uh, very relevant to what we've discussed tonight. Um, Clearchos um, also um, referred to the softer principles, uh, rule of law principles of good governance, particularly at the uh, Council of Europe level. I also wanted to bring your attention to the uh, UN level which has um, a, a code of 11 principles of good governance. And I wanted to insist on the umbrella terms of effectiveness and accountability, which actually um, encompass most of the principles. So having said that, and uh, before getting into the details of some of the things that uh, were said tonight, I have one question for all of you. And uh, the question is, what does it take to transit from a culture of a tick the box or, or money laundering compliance that Professor Levy actually described to an anti-crime culture? What are the main impediments? We have seen quite a few tonight. So my question in a few sentences to all of you is, what do you think it should take? for this transition to happen. Thank you. And in, in, in the order of presentation, if you want, Professor Levy, thank you. OK. Uh, uh, the, well, it's a very good question. The, uh, first, you, you have to be willing to make less money. Uh, that's uh, what, and, and your partners, have to be willing to let you make less money without firing you. Um, uh, and that's a tough call. Um, and your government has to be willing to accept le fewer fees for registration of companies, um, to uh, pay more costs towards um, enforcement of uh, criminal law and also regulations. Uh, and the professional bodies have to be uh, willing to, um, to discipline more members. Yeah, so immediately it's beginning to look less appealing uh, to some. The, uh, uh, you know, I've been in this business a long time. And the, yeah, when General Eisenhower, who was not only the president of the US, but was also head of the uh, uh, yeah, chiefs of staff in the Second World War, uh, talked about a military industrial complex um, in the US. Uh, we have a kind of anti money laundering, anti bribery uh, complex. Some of, uh, you know, we don't mind increasing the number of people of compliance officers, uh, but actually losing a lot of business um, to other jurisdictions on the basis of, well, if we don't take them, somebody else may, but so what? We, we're going to, virtue is its own reward, as King Lear tells us. Um, and uh, so we have to be prepared to be more virtuous and lose money um, and call out those who take our clients, the clients that would have gone to us and the business 
and uh, encourage um, FATF to sanction their own members as much as FATF style regional body members, which they are starting to do, to be fair. Um, but we have to think about, well, what does substantive compliance uh, uh, look like? Uh, and frankly, it will involve less business. And, and But it, it's better if everybody in the world does it, then you might manage crime down. Um, but that's not being done enough. In, instead, we uh, have to pick off our own jurisdiction or other jurisdictions. And that's what makes it uh, hard. So you have to turn down uh, business. Uh, well, I won't steal Cleacos's thunder, um, but the but just pointing out the way the UK behaved towards Russians and also the way uh, um, that Cyprus behaved towards Russians uh, uh, as well. Yeah, thought, well, they have reformed. Uh, they're now good guys. We used to think that Ukrainians were bad guys as well two years ago. Um, now we think differently. Um, but scrutiny of the origins of Ukrainian money remains an important issue. Um, uh, but but we go easy on the pedal. So I think we have to be more honest with ourselves about what good governance uh, uh, really means. Um, and be prepared for disappointment because other countries may not be as quick to follow in the path of virtue uh, as as we are. Thank you, for Professor Livy, for sharing uh, wise words with us. And uh, food for thought, thank you so much. Uh, Dimitra, do you want to add something to the question or to that dimension? What does it take? I mean, let me add something briefly. I mean, to Professor uh, Livy, wise words, I mean, uh, when uh, so when you started talking, you painted um, uh, very well a Cypriot reality and uh, what the lawyers and other practitioners uh, in Cyprus uh, are facing on a daily basis. But I don't think this is only a Cypriot uh, specific okay. problem. Um, even though we are uh, quite often the target of, <laughs> of, of criticism, uh, not without the reason. But having seen this both from the academic perspective and from the perspective of a practicing lawyer, uh, it's not only about uh, learning to be virtuous, it, it takes a little faith, it takes quite a lot of people and um, from the public sector, the pub private sector, to actually do their job in the end. And it's far easier said than done. And, I mean, uh, when it comes to Cyprus, I mean, to a, um, with varying degrees of success, Cyprus has been implementing as uh, a matter of law its international obligations, but as a matter of practice and effectiveness in practice. I mean, I think there is a serious gap there, and that's where uh, the core problem lies. So, okay, we have the law, so what do we do about it? I mean, uh, it has its advantages, it has its disadvantages, but what is its real impact in practice? So these are my few uh, words. <laughs> Thank you, Dimitra. Indeed, that happens in practice. Thank you very much. Christian, do you want to add something to the discussion? Yeah, I, I feel like I'm, I'm sort of the continuously the pessimistic one in the bunch. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if you can create a sort of an anti-crime culture. I think it depends a lot, and we covered this a bit on our on our previous uh, seminar regarding corruption. I, I think there are so many compo different historical components within a culture that creates certain behavior uh, that uh, it's a question of time and and also it's it's a question of how the state the willingness of the state on maintaining let's say the social contract with its citizens uh so it, you know it, it it's almost as if you you know 
see if if you look if you look at the legislations and so on of this sort of anti uh, you know uh, the, the the preventional measures as your arsenal let's say you know it can be weak or it can be strong and the question is is it strong enough that the person who is going to engage in a criminal activity because i think you can never you can't eradicate crime you can only do that in very uh, uh, you know, intrusive d dictatorships, and we we don't want that. Uh, but but uh, you know, you have to have a, a system where the the person who is committing the crime thinks again whether or not they're well, they're willing to take the risk of doing it. You know, you, you're never going to be able to prevent it. But if you you have to have a system where perhaps this is where the difference lies. Let's say in in other you know more less crime countries, uh, you know, as we like the lack of a better term, is that the, the, the additional thought, do I really want to take this risk? Because there's a bigger risk of me getting caught and there's a bigger risk for me for consequences to be compared to a country where I can basically do whatever I want and nothing bad is going to happen to me. So I'm doing it or I know that I can get out of it. Uh, and this is a process. Uh, I don't think that by over flooding the system with regulations and 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 procedures and so on is is going to to solve that. It's a it's a it needs to be done on a holistic uh, approach. To it. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Indeed, um, but let's be optimistic. Uh, Claire, a few words before we actually uh, take on a couple of other points. Yes, the, the original question was what did it take to transit from a tick box culture to a sort of a, a more cultural based uh, change? I'll, again, I'll go back to the United Kingdom and I'll give you an example of a case which did have a really good effect in terms of cleaning up the system up to a point. It's the case involving uh, Crown and David Chater and others. And the case reached the Supreme Court in 2010, it was reported at UKSC 52. The case began with a, a, an excellent example of investigative journalism and an attempt to use the Freedom of Information Act to unearth the expenses and allowances documents in the UK House of Commons. And there was initially a, a resistance on the part of the authorities to release the, the relevant documents and eventually they were, they were released and we discovered that some uh, members of, of Parliament were submitting uh, dubious uh, claims for their expenses and allowances. The, some of the MPs who were facing charges for breaching Section 17 of the Theft Act 1968, which relates to false accounting, they tried to put forward a defence that the expenses and allowances claims that they put into the UK parliamentary authorities were shielded from the courts by virtue of parliamentary uh, privilege under the Bill of Rights of 1689. And the case went all the way up to the, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and the Supreme Court held against the defendants in those proceedings, including Mr. Chater. And uh, they were eventually uh, brought to justice uh, in the criminal court. What that did was it did two things. Firstly, it demonstrated that effective investigative journalism allied to effective use of freedom of information laws are capable of exposing wrongdoing. What it did secondly was it reminded everybody that nobody is above the law, not even uh, elected members of the House of Commons. And that had quite a, um, a, a good effect, if I can use that's not quite the right word, but it had quite a, an electrifying effect on members of Parliament that they couldn't get away with the bad practices and, and uh, dubious practices of the past. But what it also did was it demonstrated to the public, at least, that law enforcement is a, as applicable to parliamentarians as to anybody else. We haven't yet, in so far as I can tell, had an expenses and allowances scandal of that nature in, in the Republic of Cyprus, nor, we, nor have we yet had an expose of that nature 
uh, in the Republic of Cyprus, with one exception, which I'm not going to mention because it's going through the criminal courts now, but that was not investigative journalism uh, from within the Republic of Cyprus, it was investigative journalism from outside the Republic of Cyprus. I'll go no further than that. So to sum up, um, it, and the good thing is in the United Kingdom, we did uh, introduce as a consequence of the expenses and allowances scandal, a new system for parliamentarians to submit their expenses and allowances claims. But of course, it didn't stop the scandals that we've seen over the last few years. Uh, I have to say, regrettably, involving uh, uh, the ex-Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson during his prime ministership. His prime ministership was marked by one uh, scandal after another. So it, that case didn't clean up British politics, but it helped to improve matters. We need to have similar cases in the Republic of Cyprus, I, and I hope we will over the next few years. Thank you, Clarke. At this stage, we can mention the work uh, of our Centre of Excellence, our Germany Centre of Excellence for the Rule of Law and European Values, whose task, main task is to evaluate the state of the rule of law and European values in uh, Cyprus and the wider region, with reference to a number of uh, pillars and indicators, and uh, we are tracking in particular this kind of high profile corruption cases and uh, and so on and and investigative journalism and media pluralism is also part of what we are tracking so uh, such mechanisms can help in, uh, in 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 raising the culture enhancing the culture the anti crime culture uh, just before we close, there was a question from a participant in the chat, and um, the question had to do with, you know, the lack of harmonization. So this this is what um, Dimitra touched upon in particular, um, meaning that, um, you know, we are dealing with clients uh, all over the world uh, with proceeds uh, of monies from uh, across the world and uh, with different legal cultures and understandings of um, what uh, economic crime may be, uh, as we pointed out now. And uh, it may be difficult for professionals, um, compliance professionals, banking, um, legal, accounting professionals, who are the first ones, the frontline workers dealing with uh, the know your customers, um, well, procedures and practices, it may be difficult for them sometimes to uh, fully explain to their clients what can be done and what cannot be done uh, in specific jurisdictions. Uh, and I think all of us who've pra who have practiced law uh, or practiced compliance somehow can relate to this. And of course, the fact that we have a, a minimum harmonization, and this is only for the EU, I mean, uh, this is not even, uh, you know, at the global level, uh, creates more room for, of course, interpretation and, and more discretion. So that particular uh, participant was just raising that point that there may be a difference in the interpretation of obligations, uh, by clients, uh, but also by professionals and by professional uh, bodies or responsible bodies. And this is probably one of the windows uh, that uh, um, help or trigger or, or enhance um, transnational economic crime. Uh, I don't know if anyone has something to add to this and then we'll, we'll close. Well, maybe, uh, I mean, I mean, our members of our committee um, who are uh, um, more expert in practice than I am uh, uh, go around the country and so I occasionally um, doing seminars for practitioners and 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 explaining to them the pitfalls with real cases um, and we also have annual conferences uh, or periodic conferences online and in person um, to uh, explain to people the shifts and what and, and how to and how to implement coming back to the pessimistic uh, uh, Christian um, the um, going back to the pessimistic perspective how how 
uh, they can avoid being entrapped by people. Um, so those are important uh, things that the Law Society Money Laundering Task Force um, tries to do. Yeah, how far everybody really wants to take that advice um, it is up to them. Uh, I mean, in a sense, until you see more people being hanged, um, then uh, it's difficult to get people to focus very consciously on the risks to themselves as well as the risks to society. Indeed, Professor Levy, and of course, uh, we very often turn to the Law Society uh, for best practice uh, here in Cyprus, but not only. And uh, I'm happy to hear what you're saying, and I think this is um, something we need to enhance here. And uh, it's very good that we are, we are, we have in our um, company our chair, who obviously here represents uh, ICPAC which again is a professional body which uh, together with the Cyprus Bar Association regulates quite a lot of professionals on the island of Cyprus and therefore uh, we could, you know, draw good example uh, from practices across the UK and other jurisdictions and, and, and enhance. A lot is being done in Cyprus, but obviously uh, perhaps not enough. We also do a lot of CPDs uh, of that type uh, at the university, at the School of Law of Uclan Cyprus, particularly Clarkos and, and Christian. Uh, actually use real cases and, uh, and, and you know, yeah. Uh, we fall short, of course, of giving legal advice because we're not allowed to do that uh, under, you know, legal profession rules. But yes, uh, to warn about risks and potential consequences is something that all of us can do, whether we're academics or professionals. So that's very important. Thank you so much. Claire, here you want to say a few uh, final words and then uh, the world where well, the floor goes back to the chair. Thank you. First of all, I have to hold my hands up. I, I, I was uploading my slides onto the Microsoft team system and at the same time I've deleted somebody else's slides. So can I in, please invite whoever's slide show I've deleted to please re-upload it. I, 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 I've just done something that I've encouraged my students to do, which is hold their hands up when, when they've made a mistake. The, the 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 other point that I wanted to do, or the, the other point I wanted to make, was in answer to Banayoda's question. Um, it, it's to do with sort of the the differentiation of approaches. Um, that gives me an opportunity to just reinforce something that I only had time to touch on: the mindset of lawyers, accountants, and other professionals in the Republic of Cyprus needs to undergo a shift for two reasons among others but the two that I will flag up are number one we are now in the post Brexit era so for example before Brexit the United Kingdom financial sanctions regime was part and parcel of the EU financial sanctions regime we now have a separate UK financial sanctions regime which in some respects resembles the EU financial regime but in other respects is materially different so for example the very limited EU sanctions in relation to Turkey uh, are not replicated in uh, the statute uh, book of the United Kingdom that's just one simple example so the mindset of everyone in the Republic needs to undergo a shift we're in a post Brexit environment we can't think of the UK in the way that we did from 1973 until uh, Brexit was completed at the end of 2020. Uh, the, the, the second point is that we are now in the post-Ukraine conflict era in earnest. That era began in 2014, but it has now entered into sort of a devastating new phase with uh, with the, the Russian reinvasion, as I call it, of Ukraine in in 2022 and that has given rise to an altogether different set of um anxieties 
for example, increased opportunities for financial sanctions evasion, increased opportunities for uh, money laundering schemes designed to disguise um, money that may be going to, to questionable destinations to do with that conflict or, or gun running or other forms of, of, of skullduggery. So we need to undergo a, a shift in, in, in thinking. However, the fundamental principles remain the same. The, the, the details may differ in the, the various legis bits of legislation that spew out of, of parliaments, but the fundamental principles of good governance, uh, uh, good management, good leadership, that they're timeless and they just need to be adjusted for the new epoch that we're in uh, rather than rebuilt from scratch. So hopefully that's, a, that's an optimistic to note to end on, that what we've learnt in the past is by and large applicable in the present and the future. We just need to uh, engage in, in some adjustments to deal with the new, the new realities that we're in. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, I also wanted to just say a couple of words before uh, I give back the floor to our chair, just to say that um, our uh, partner, the uh, CISI, the uh, Chartered Institute for Investments and Securities, Securities and Investment rather, um, actually has a, a mine of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, materials of relevance to what we're doing here. And that's also a good source of inspiration in many different ways because they've got di different types of uh, uh, materials and, and uh, courses and so on and so forth also to be looking at. And um, um, also to mention that the final uh, webinar in this series that um, the Law School of Ukraine Cyprus, but also ICPAC and the CISI have put together. It's actually next week on the 30th of March. Same time, not same place. It's a Zoom, the next one. And uh, there is still time to register, so please get in touch with us. And uh, the idea is that uh, we will uh, take advantage of all the knowledge we have uh, built together across the first three webinars to, uh, discuss, to discuss it in two different formats, which is a speak up format. And uh, the emphasis will be placed on whistleblowing and uh, how we can uh, make good use of this across jurisdictions. So thank you very much. That's it from me, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Uh, thank you to all the speakers uh, we had tonight and all the participants. Very interesting uh, topic, and I don't think two hours enough to cover everything, but uh, very good insights were from what we've heard. For one, uh, for me, uh, harmonization is, uh, I think it's, uh, probably a solution, because we've seen that money laundering is not uh, static, and uh, we've seen money laundering moving to less, I would say, uh, regulated jurisdictions as a result of uh, increased legislation, especially in Europe, and we've seen, especially after the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine, um, uh, companies moving to less, I would say, uh, dubious or less regulated uh, uh, jurisdictions. Thank you very much to all of you. It was a pleasure chairing this uh, panel of distinguished speakers. Uh, hopefully we have the opportunity again sometime in the near future. Thank you and good night. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good night.